It's the Popori Show. A comforting quarter of an hour of reflection, nostalgia and encouragement. An alternative to Zumba and quantitative easing. With a soup song of humour and spiritual uplift. We begin today with Mike Ellis reading from the message paraphrase. Psalm 139 God, investigate my life. Get all the facts first hand. I'm an open book to you. Even from a distance, you know what I'm thinking. You know when I leave and when I get back. I'm never out of your sight. You know everything I'm going to say before I start the first sentence. I look behind and you're there. Then up ahead and you're there too. Your reassuring presence coming and going. This is too much, too wonderful. I can't take it all in. Is there any place I can go to avoid your spirit to be out of your sight? If I climb to the sky, you're there. If I go underground, you're there. If I flew on morning's wings to the far western horizon, you'd find me in a minute. You're already there, waiting. Then I say to myself, oh, he even sees me in the dark. At night, I'm immersed in the light. In fact, darkness isn't dark to you. Night and day, darkness and light, they're all the same to you. Oh, yes, you shaped me first inside, then out. You formed me in my mother's womb. I thank you, high God, you're breathtaking. Body and soul I am marvellously made. I worship in adoration. What a creation. You know me, inside and out. You know every bone in my body. You know exactly how I was made, bit by bit. How I was sculpted from nothing into something. Like an open book, you watched me grow from conception to birth. All the stages of my life were spread out before you. The days of all my life all prepared, before I'd even lived one day. Your thoughts, how rare, how beautiful. God, I'll never comprehend them. I couldn't even begin to count them any more than I could count the sand of the sea. Oh, let me rise in the morning and live always with you. And please, God, do away with wickedness for good. And you murderers, out of here. All the men and women who belittle you, God, infatuated with cheap God imitations. See how I hate those who hate you, God. See how I loathe all this godless arrogance. I hate it with pure, unadulterated hatred. Your enemies are my enemies. Investigate my life, O God. Find out everything about me. Cross-examine and test me. Get a clear picture of what I'm about. See for yourself whether I've done anything wrong. Then guide me on the road to eternal life. In the winter of 1944-45, Steve Metcalf was just 17 and he was suffering the privations of the Japanese civilian internment camp at Waifang, northern China, when a balding, middle-aged Scottish internee approached him with a pair of running shoes, repaired with discarded string, to replace the threadbare ones on his feet. Steve Metcalf took them gratefully. The fact that the Scotsman was Eric Liddell, Olympic 400 metre champion in the 1924 Games, and that the running shoes no doubt meant a great deal to him, did not dawn on Metcalf. His feet were cold and Liddell was too diffident a man to make anything of it. Little had been working as a missionary in some of the poorest regions of China for some years. Devoutedly religious, his refusal to run on a Sunday in the Olympics was later made famous in the Oscar-winning film Chariots of Fire, 1981. He recognised that Steve Metcalf was a good sportsman and built his self-confidence by drawing him into organising sport in the internment camp and coached him in running. Metcalf raced twice against Liddell, once having a head start, beating him to the finishing line. However, the greatest challenge Liddell gave his young protégé was to love your enemy and to pray for their Japanese guards. This was in stark contrast to the general desire of those around him to get one over on their captors. When you hate, you are self-centred, Liddell told Steve Metcalf. 
When you pray, you are God-centred. It's hard to hate the people God loves. Praying changes your attitude. When Liddell died in the camp a few weeks later, Metcalf was among those who carried his coffin to the graveside. Their meeting had changed his life irrevocably. He promised God that if he survived the war, he would go to Japan as a missionary. As a pupil at the China Inland Mission Christian Boarding School in Shandong Province, Steve Metcalf had been placed in internment alongside his fellow pupils and school teachers following Japan's entry into the war in 1941. Metcalf followed in his parents' footsteps and married a missionary colleague. He met Evelyn Robinson when she joined the mission outreach in Hirosaki in 1956. Initially, his feelings for her were not reciprocated, but when his train was diverted to Hirosaki during a snowstorm, he found her astonished at his unexpected appearance at the mission home. She had told God categorically that she had no intention of marrying Mr. Metcalf unless he turned up on her doorstep that very morning. And now here he was. Metcalf was first and foremost a quiet and constant evangelist with a great talent for storytelling. After their marriage, he and his wife were engaged in church planting, establishing and nurturing small but growing churches, chiefly in cities across Honshu Island. Just before their retirement in 1990, they founded the Uruyasu International Church on a new housing development on the outskirts of Tokyo. In the UK, the Metcalfs settled at Trinity Road Baptist Church in Tooting and Steve Metcalf took up an invitation to help lead the London Japanese Christian Fellowship, holding this position for the next 15 years. In 2003, he visited Japan on a tour organised by Agape, a Christian organisation promoting reconciliation. He spoke of the need for forgiveness. He was asked by a Japanese publisher to recount his experiences during internment and to educate young Japanese about the realities of the war and the Christian concept of reconciliation. Take the Torch Shining in the Dark was published in Japanese in 2005. In 2005, Metcalf was invited by the Chinese authorities to the 60th anniversary celebration of liberation at Waifang internment camp, where he delivered the Eric Liddell memorial speech. Liddell had, he told the assembled internees and Chinese officials, given him two things, his running shoes and his baton of forgiveness. He taught me to love my enemies and pray for them, he said. Steve Metcalf, missionary, went to glory on June the 7th, 2014, aged 86. Here's an intriguing conundrum. This person was born in Llanethly in 1923 into an Anglo-Russian family. He had three trilingual nomadic uncles, plus one who was a sword dancer and a balalaika player, though not necessarily at the same time. His mother spoke three or four Caucasian languages and was a Muslim. His father, Herbert Alfredovich, married her in Odessa in 1917. This mystery person attended Westminster School with Anthony Wedgwood Benn, Peter Ustinov and Michael Flanders. He went up to Christchurch, Oxford, where he did Russian studies. In World War II, he was a conscientious objector, working with the Quaker Friends Ambulance Unit. In his autobiography, he tells of a vision he had in Palestine. He writes... It was during my first visit to Jerusalem that I had a vision of Christ walking behind me as though he had appeared especially to confirm my belief. 
I had just seen the whole of the Jericho Valley from the top of the Mount of Olives during the most beautiful red sunset. Russian Orthodox music was issuing mellifluously out of the convent on the hill. The effect of this vision lasted three months. In the camp, I would wake up in the morning with this wonderful feeling of Christ's presence in the tent. The more I think about this experience, the more I realise my illness was an important factor. Well, later in life, this man became friends with C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien, both of whom were Oxford Dons. This mystery man was pianist, composer, performer. Have you solved the conundrum? He's best known for his 11-year partnership in 1,700 performances with Michael Flanders. It's Donald Swan, and here he is with Flanders singing Too Many Cookers. When we had an old-fashioned kitchen Cooking was a slow but easy-going job A place to talk, a place to sit and stitch in While we kept half an eye on the kettle on the hob Our kitchen on the modern plan Maybe a fancy looker But we jumped out of the frying pan Into the pressure cooker We have every sort of gadget now For every sort of chore But it's much more work and worry Than it ever was before There are cables on the tables With plugs of every shape And what we save in elbow grease We send on insulating tape is quite prodigious at refrigerating grub, but every 40 minutes it goes ba 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 <laughs> We're confused by all the fuses, the oven changes gear, instead of a cook you really need a consulting engineer. There's a pinger on the ringer, we can't hear each other speak. That thing on the shelf's been whipping itself for the best part of a week. <laughs> The pilot light is winking, we can't locate the switch With every sort of gadget, but we don't know which is which With our new pneumatic ISA, self-actuated dice, the ideal for cooking rice And the hard-boiled duck eggs, with the universal grater And a pink desiccator, the vibrating dehydrator And a plastic percolator And the electric coffee grinder, the serrated bacon rinder The expungeable reminder and the vermicelli winder Oh, we've every sort of gadget it's rather odd to think we still can't open sardine tins And we still stop up at the sink <laughs> We don't want a labour-saving kitchen We much prefer the one we had before Why did science have to pitch in To our nice old-fashioned pigeon? Please don't save us labour anymore. At a general election, a lot of candidates stand for funny political parties. They add some amusement to the proceedings. Probably the best known was Screaming Lord Such, who stood for the Monster Raving Looney Party. In Canada, there was the Extreme Wrestling Party and the Fed Up Party. In Australia, the Surprise Party and the Deadly Serious Party. In Belarus, the Beer Lovers Party. It was liquidated in 1998. In the UK, the Fancy Dress Party. In Denmark, the Union of Conscientiously Workshy Elements. It was founded by a Danish comedian who actually won a seat in the national parliament. Amongst their campaign promises, there were the promise of better weather, tailwinds on all bike paths, and more Renaissance furniture in IKEA stores. And the last one, in Poland, the Bald Party, which supported all bald candidates. I don't know if they lost their deposit. The Popori Show. A miscellaneous collection, a combination of incongruous things, a melange, a ragbag, omnium gatherum, an amalgam of things...
Till next time, it's Derek Lindley wishing you every blessing and thanks for listening.